one. The lab is destroyed. I need immediate support. Please come back. Sauce. I'm, uh, I'm Jake, and boy, is it good to see you. I didn't know that you had survived the lab. But good news, I think that I killed the parasite. Or if I didn't, it'll at least freeze to death in the cold. And I have never seen anything like that. A parasite that can actually take over the human body. What makes that parasite unique, or what made it unique, is that in general, humans aren't as susceptible to the influence of parasites. However, in Kathleen Nicola's book, This Is Your Brain on Parasites, she gives an interesting example. If a cold germ makes you cough, is that your body trying to clear the infection from your lungs, or the parasite tickling the back of your throat so that you'll spread the germ? It's the manipulation hypothesis, when a parasite purposefully changes the behavior of the host, and it does this to increase its chances of transmission to spread. An example of this can be seen in humans with the guinea worm, which gets into your body through stagnant water. In that water, there might be water fleas, which carry the guinea worm larvae. Our stomach acid dissolves the flea, but not the larvae, the parasite. It grows into worms that push inside the intestinal walls and procreate in your abdominal muscles. The male worms die and get absorbed by your body, but the female grows and continues to grow until it's about a meter long. It spreads its way through your connective tissue, making its way to a lower extremity, your foot, calf, etc. And it stays there for about a year inside the host without you knowing. And by this point, the female has a lot of larvae, so it releases an acid that makes your skin blister and boil. So your body's reaction is to dip that pain into some water. And in doing so, the female ejects all of the larvae from her mouth, hundreds of thousands of them, back into the water, completing the life cycle and starting anew. And then there are some parasites that, unlike the guinea worm, don't keep themselves hidden inside you. Instead, like in the case of the green banded brood sac, they change your appearance. A snail unknowingly eats bird droppings infested with brood sac eggs. The eggs hatch inside the snail, forming long tubes that spread into the snail's brain and tentacles, its eye stalks. It fills the stalks up so fully that it stretches the walls so thin that you can see the parasite through it, colorful and pulsating. And those pulsating bands are brood sac larvae. Because the parasite has pretty much taken over the snail's eyes, it is visually impaired. It spends a lot more time out in the sun because it can't tell the difference between dark and light. And a bird sees this, sees those pulsating eye stalks and goes, hey, those look like some delicious caterpillar grubs. So it swoops on down, takes a bite, flies back up, but now it has brood sac larvae all up in its stomach and they're reproducing. And the eggs then go into the bird droppings, creating the cycle again, rinse and repeat. It's a form of aggressive mimicry. The parasite resembles the food of the predator it wants as a host. And then it uses the host as a kind of living taxi traveling from point A to point B, it's transient. To continue its life cycle, it has to find a new home. But then there are parasites that are more insidious. They just don't use the host body as transport, nor do they use the host bodily reactions in favor of the parasite. Instead, they take over the mind. Ampulex compressa, the jewel wasp. It stings a cockroach in the thorax, temporarily paralyzing it. Quickly, it moves to the roach's head where it precisely stings and injects a poison that blocks the neural area for decision-making. 
taking away the cockroach's free will. The wasp then bites off the antennae of the roach, slurping out fluid from the open stems, and leads it to the wasp's burrow and lays an egg on its abdomen. The wasp then closes up the burrow, leaving the relaxing cockroach and the egg in there. About three days later, the egg hatches and starts eating the still alive cockroach. And what started as an ectoparasite, external, becomes an endoparasite, internal, as the larva eats its way into the cockroach. And it does it in such a way that the cockroach stays alive as the larva sucks out its intestines. And then, after that, the larva cocoons itself inside of the cockroach, bursts out as a fully grown wasp, and the host finally dies. And there are many other kinds of parasites, like cordyceps that sprout out of an ant's head and rain spores down onto other ants, or ones that take over the tongues of fish. There's even one that an estimated half the human population has that you can get from cat feces. More than 1,400 parasites prey on humans, and those are just the ones that we know about. With some parasites, you don't even know that they're in you. They stay hidden as a survival tactic. Others can take you over completely. Which brings us to a parasite that most resembles the one that we were facing at the lab, Sacculina. Sacculina is a parasite that infects crabs. It finds a soft spot on the joints of the crab, uses a sharp part of its body, and injects itself inside. It then spreads throughout the crab like roots in the ground, creeping into organs, the nervous system, and the crab's eye stalks. It even grows a sac on the underside of the crab where the eggs would be, but are now the reproductive part of the parasite. The crab stops molting, growing, it becomes sterilized. Its purpose now is to continue the life cycle of this parasite. It loses its free will, it becomes a suit of armor, a robot being controlled by an operator. From the outside, it looks the same. It generally acts the same. But inside, is the cockroach, the crab, or the snail aware of what is happening? Does it know that it no longer has free will? Just like the bacteria in our gut, which is more plentiful than the cells in our own body, can dictate our diets without us being conscious of it, maybe a parasite could do the same. The difference being that the bacteria is in a symbiotic relationship with us. It is mutually beneficial, and in a parasitic relationship, it is not really a benefit to the host. However, parasites are important to the overall ecosystem. And when we zoom out and think about this ecosystem, it's easy to understand the philosophical idea of us and the planet we are currently on. What started out as a symbiotic relationship between humans and Earth could now be seen as parasitic. I mean, even pregnancy could be thought of as a parasitism. <laughs> uh, I don't know, sorry man, I kinda, Whew, I don't, my brain has been all over the place recently. Uh, I think I've been out here for too long. I don't actually know how long I've been out here for. <laughs> okay. To me, the scariest part is, how do you know that your actions are your own? If you were to get a parasite, one that could control your body and your mind, would you ever know? I mean, how do I know that the words that are coming out of my mouth are, are mine? How do I know that you aren't infected? That thing at the lab could become anyone, could become any living organism. I, I don't feel different, but would I ever be able to tell? How do you know if your mind is lying. Maybe, maybe we should just uh, sit here and, and just wait. This is emergency control, we received your SOS. Please give us exact coordinates for rescue. Just wait and watch the fire die. Again, this is emergency control. Please give us and, coordinates And, as always, Thanks for watching.
Oh, that was an uplifting ending, wasn't it? I just wanted to take a moment to, to really thank Brilliant.org for supporting this episode. It's because of them that I was able to actually have a location and costumes and props and stuff like that, which is, for me as a filmmaker, incredibly valuable to telling a story. And Brilliant.org is a, a really great resource. It's something that we all use here at Vsauce. And it's a wonderful website where you can take different courses, be it math or physics or logic, which is what I'm currently doing. I'm really into logic puzzles. So there's all of these courses just on that, and this one in particular I'm taking because I love these kind of puzzles and riddles. So if you'd like to support Brilliant because they were nice enough to support Vsauce, there is a link at the top of the description, brilliant.org slash Vsauce 3. You get 20% off your subscription, and that is only for the first 3,333 people that sign up. It really is a great website, and they allowed me to make this video idea that I've been having for months now. So thank you, Brilliant, and thank you for watching.